Good afternoon and welcome. I am Nikki Harris, Training and Education Lead for the Center of Excellence for Behavioral Health in Nursing Facilities. And it is my pleasure to oversee the delivery of mental health and substance use disorder training and education to nursing facilities nationally at no cost to the nursing facility. If you are attending today's training and did not register, please place your name and organization in the chat. If you are attending in a group, please email your names and organization to my email following today's training. I will place my email in the chat box. It is my pleasure to introduce our presenter for today, Mr. Brian Stevens. Mr. Stevens is a licensed professional counselor and the founder and CEO of Talk Forward, which provides psychotherapy and executive counseling consulting services. Brian has practiced in behavioral health for the past 30 years. With 20 years of executive management experience, Brian served as a chief executive officer in the public behavioral health agencies with over 450 employees. Brian is a specialist in clinical supervision. He currently serves as the president of the LPCA, which has over 8,000 members. And now I'll turn it over to Brian for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, I'm excited uh, to be here with you all today and was excited to get to ask to, to come talk. So um, my goal is to get these slides knocked out um, with you all have a little bit of time for questions uh, at the end. Um, so if you all have some questions, I understand, put them into the chat box and then we will try to get to them. So what are we talking about today? So today's an overview of schizophrenia and psychosis. And the, and the goal today is to gain an understanding of schizophrenia, um, be able to recognize and understand signs and symptoms of schizophrenia um, and psychosis and participants. I hope you'll be able to learn some appropriate responses and engagement because I think um, that's what we want to see uh, when we have to manage um, our residents. So schizophrenia itself is a serious mental disorder and it affects how a person thinks, feels, and behaves. So it has a global impact. Um, unlike depression, which is classified as a mood disorder, schizophrenia is classified as a type of thought disorder. Um, it is generally like, considered to be lifelong. Once somebody's diagnosed, this is gonna be something that they struggle with is a chronic illness throughout their lives. Most commonly we see an onset in late teens um, or early 20s. It's not quite understood why uh, that would be the case. Um, there's some hypothesis that has to do is the brain's kind of doing its final setting in is, you know, as we all know, around 25 or so um, is when our brains are fully uh, baked and, and developed. So I kind of wonder in my case, it might've been more like 28 or 30 um, based upon what my parents tell me, but. 25 is the average. Uh, men tend to have that onset uh, younger uh, than women. Um, and there is a secondary onset in women in middle age around menopause. So that's not super well understood. Um, a late life onset of schizophrenia is really quite uncommon. And what we see for psychosis later in life is that there's usually some other causes. Um, and with that in mind, let me talk a little bit about what psychosis is. So the National Institute of Mental Health defines psychosis as a collection of symptoms affecting the mind where there's been some loss of contact with reality. So when somebody's having a psychotic episode, their thoughts, their perceptions can be disrupted and they have difficulty recognizing what is real and what is not real. And I think, you know, psychosis then is kind of the classic, what people I think classically think of when we think about somebody being insane, that they've lost contact with reality. Multiple illnesses can actually lead us to psychosis, um, not just schizophrenia, but it is in fact one of the kind of chief characteristics that we see with schizophrenia. 
often you have these psychotic states that begin in young adulthood. Um, like I said, when the person's in their late teens or mid twenties. Um, however, people can experience a psychotic episode um, at younger and older ages and can happen as part of many disorders or illnesses outside of schizophrenia. Uh, older adults we know with neurological disorders uh, can be at higher risk of psychosis. So it may not be schizophrenia, but it may be something else. So, um, and that can be a symptom of diseases in older age, such as Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, um, and any other uh, related uh, dementias that we see. So psychosis can be part um, of those dementias. Other things that can cause psychosis um, also include lack of sleep. So any one of us could actually be induced to have a psychotic break or be in a psychotic state um, if we just weren't allowed to sleep for long enough. Um, so that's that's how important that's how important sleep is. Obviously, certain drugs can induce psychosis. Um, people can respond to steroids with psychosis. So there's a number of things that can that can cause it. So looking at schizophrenia as a whole, we have kind of three clusters of symptoms, positive, negative, and cognitive. Now, I know, you know, when I was first learning about it, I'm like, what do you mean positive symptoms? It doesn't mean that they're good. It means that they're symptoms, right, that um, add to the person's experience, whereas negative symptoms are symptoms of uh, negation or where the person loses functionality. Probably most classic symptoms of schizophrenia are that people understand are positive. So we talk about hallucinations. So this is hearing uh, voices, seeing visions. Um, it can even be uh, olfactory or smelling things that aren't there, feeling things that aren't there, tasting things that aren't there. So there's there's no sense that is immune to hallucinations. Usually voices are the most common, but I, I've had I've had a client who experienced sexual abuse as a child, um, and that client uh, had pretty significant tactile hallucinations um, as part of their schizophrenia. Uh, delusions, then, I, I think is another kind of classic um, example where um, the person has a belief system that doesn't comport with reality. I think paranoia is probably the most commonly uh, known sort of delusion. Oh, the people are out to get me. But this can include such things as I, you know, it's, oh, the FBI is monitoring me. Um, I'm a secret agent. Um, and I've seen, you know, people get you can have a lot of religiosity with delusions a client otherwise pretty functional but just sure she was engaged in ongoing spiritual warfare um which is you know that was interesting uh but it wasn't fortunately didn't interfere too much with her functioning but it was really quite fixed um often these delusions then can can interface with hallucinations um, and seeing things that are incorrect. So for instance, somebody with delusions, uh, delusional activity might well think and perceive somebody else's expression, tone, or other things as maybe more hostile than they actually are. Disordered thoughts then are when the, what we see is when somebody's really now having difficulty being coherent. Um, and this might be, I might might be in addition to or on top of hallucinations or delusions. It might be on its own, but somebody with disordered thoughts stops really being able to be organized. So that executive functioning that we need is just really um, collapsing. And self-care becomes very difficult for these people uh, as their thoughts um, start to fall off. Uh, and get more and more disordered. So negative symptoms then um, don't get a lot of uh, they don't get a lot of press. They don't get talked about a lot. 
Um, but these actually can be very persistent, um, even with medication. In the days before we had the more modern atypical antipsychotics, mostly we had medications that would address the positive symptoms, but leave the negative symptoms intact. This can be a flat affect, so almost immobile facial expressions, monotonous voice. Um, often what I have seen goes along with a flat affect, which, it, which is it's really hard to tell what they're feeling looking at them and talking to them, is an inability to read and monitor the uh, affect of others. So um, what this can mean is sometimes people who have this flat affect can seem uh, uh, kind of intrusive because they're no longer able to pick up on normal social cues. Um, and so you might be sending off subtle signals of, hey, I need to go. I don't, I can't keep talking to you right now, but the person's not able to pick up on them at all. And you might have to be a little bit more directive. Um, you can see a diminished ability to initiate and sustain planned activities. Um, <clears throat> and this can be literally, you know, yes, okay. I remember being a case manager doing a home visit and be like, all right, we laid it out. You're going to take your meds tonight. And then the person just would not be able to continue that planned activity. It's like, I'm, I'm there at three. You just need to take your medication at six, but unable to initiate and, and do that. Um, so sometimes they can really need sustained guidance uh, just in order to move through and do the activity that we would like them to do. Um, speaking infrequently, kind of with the negative symptoms, if we think about it as a decrease of functioning, um, the person might not inter speak much. They, you know, even when you kind of get with them and you're really querying them uh, for interaction, it's like, eh, they just are not engaging. Um, interestingly, in the 1920s, um, people diagnosed with schizophrenia, what was very prevalent was people were in institutions and they were catatonic and would just kind of stand sometimes in very odd positions uh, for hours on end, not really interacting uh, with anybody else. Um, and the second half of the 20th century, we've seen a lot more paranoid uh, schizophrenia. Now, it's one of those things about this illness that's not well understood. Um, identical twins raised apart only have a 50-50 chance of de developing schizophrenia if their twin has it. So it's not just a genetic illness. There's something else going on in the environment uh, that, that creates this. So it's not really well understood why we have this, why these problems develop. Cognitive symptoms then um, are just that, again, more of that poor executive functioning. Difficulty absorbing and interpreting information. Um, difficulty have making decisions based on that new information. Um, inability to sustain attention and focus. Um, and difficulty remembering and following instructions. Um, and I, you know, I've seen this a lot with, with clients over the years. It's just that the basics of going from A to B to C to D um, really can be quite problematic for them. So what sort of things are we going to see like in a nursing facility, right? What are, what are we looking for in residents um, as behaviors um, that may be psych, you know, an idea that we're seeing some sort of psychosis? Well, kind of number one, appearing to be responding to hallucinations um, is, is, a, is a resident um, talking to somebody who isn't there. Um, you know, so if they're talking to voices or talking to folks who are not there, that's a pretty key. Um, sometimes they might just appear to be listening to somebody else during a conversation. So you could have a conversation with somebody and they keep turning their head like they're listening to somebody else and they'll turn it back to you. Um, staring intensely into empty space uh, can be another one. Um, they're maybe they're watching or they're seeing things uh, that are going on, responding to odors that are not present. Um, I had a, a client in a in a uh, independent living apartment once that was constantly putting bleach into into the sink so that um, to clean with, 
And it finally dawned on us in talking to the psychiatrist that probably what the client was doing was the client was having a smell hallucinations, like right? something smelled dirty and the bleach helped overwhelm the hallucination smell in the same way that somebody might listen to get their AirPods in and listen to music to, to overwhelm the voices. Interesting thing about hallucinations is if you put somebody getting hallucinations into an MRI, um, the part of, like say they're hearing voices, the part of their brain responsible for processing sound is active. So as far as their brain is concerned, these sounds are actually happening. Those parts of the brain are lighting up. Now it's internal stimulation, but it's very hard to tell what's a real voice and what's not a real voice. Um, somebody in the grip of psychosis might well be hyper-focused on details. Um, in our modern world where it has labels and stuff printed on everything, um, this can really draw uh, somebody with psychosis into it, especially if they've got that paranoia um, going on. Um, I've seen clients get obsessed with lot numbers on their medication, and I don't like that lot number on medication. Um, and it can be quite seem quite out of the blue what they what they get focused on. This thing got moved two inches. What does it mean? And and almost trying to apply more meaning uh, to the world than there is. And I kind of mentioned talking about that being unable to process normal social cues um, that can go with that negative symptoms. Of course, disorganized speech or behavior. Um, can certainly be a sign of psychosis that the person's just not able to be organized in what they're doing. Uh, and their speech can, you know, sometimes we talk about word salad. Um, what is it that the person is trying to say or trying to do, but it's very hard to make out? Um, unable to, or they're slow to process information or instructions. Right. So it's like, OK, I've told you X and I've told you X again. And it's the person's really having difficulty understanding what it is that they're supposed to be doing. Now, this can be cognitive symptoms, but this can also be due to hallucinations. Right. So if you think about what it is like to try to follow directions, if somebody's yelling in your ear and you're trying to listen and follow directions or if you're constantly seeing things in your vision. Um, so hallucinations can impact that as well. Uh, might have an inability to provide historical information, not really able to recall or say what's what's happened in the past. Um, certainly can appear paranoid. Um, had a couple of clients over the years that when we had to do involuntary hospitalization, the fact that it was a locked unit was actually an advantage to them. So, you know, it's a locked unit. I'm not allowed to tell anybody you're there. It actually helped them feel safe. Um, and of course, the final thing with somebody who's in the grips of psychosis is they can be unpredictable. They, we may know them, we may have a relationship with them, not psychotic, uh, but but they're a different person when the psychosis has them. So we have to be prepared uh, for that. So ways to support residents who are experiencing symptoms: be patient. Um, speak slowly with clear instructions. Um, don't make like multiple requests or a chain of requests. It's like, well, let's do one thing at a time. Um, we can want to avoid conf confrontation. Um, I think the goal is not to get into an argument with a person at that moment about hallucinations or delusions. If there's a way to work with their perceived reality when possible, do that. But of course, we got to ensure the person's safety. Like I said, so the, I'm paranoid people are out to get me. I'm going to take you someplace that's a locked facility where we're not allowed to tell anybody that you're there. Um, now, that happens to be the truth <laughs> about, about a, a psych hospital, but that, that gets them there. Um, residents are actually in a pretty safe place, if we think about it, in a nursing facility because we do have locked doors. Not anybody can come in um, and not anybody can just show up. You're, you know, you got to be on the list to come visit them. Um, always reassure and assure and reassure the resident that he or she is safe. Um, 
Psychosis is scary. If you, again, you think about it, I don't know what is real and what isn't real. Um, and definitely listen to what the resident is saying. Um, I think that's a that's pretty key. Try to, if we can understand what the person's saying um, and work with the flow until we can get them some help. Treatment of schizophrenia. So the, only like a, a doctor or somebody is going to come in um, and be able to uh, make that sort of diagnosis. But if we have psychosis, right, you're going to want uh, uh, MD to come in and do the assessment, see where they're at. Any psychotic medication uh, and is, is, can, might be used, they might prescribe that in the short term for ongoing care, um, may do tests for a lot of other medications. And of course, treatment of other medical conditions might clear psychosis. So Thing, right, UTI is the most classic of that that can cause um, delirium, or they could have a medication that's induced psychosis that could be cleared. One quick thing I do want to make sure about the atypical antipsychotics, which I think are probably the worst named class of medications ever. These came out um, as initially as new antipsychotic medications. Um, these are things like Zyprexa or Olanzapine, Respiradone, um, Geodon, Vralar. What we've discovered and what, and what the medical uh, world has discovered is these work on treatment of many things other than psychosis. So it's very important that you can't assume that because a client's taking one of these medications that they have schizophrenia or any other illness that causes psychosis. We simply cannot assume any diagnosis by the use of these medications. And I certainly see these used in all sorts of ways. Seroquel might be used to help somebody sleep, decrease a little bit of agitation. Um, just because somebody's taking it doesn't mean that they're psychotic. Non-pharmacological interventions, of course, um, we want to improve the resident's activities of daily living. Social skills training can be helpful. Coping skills uh, training, coaching, um, what are specific problems they're having. Um, and we can be focused on those problems and symptoms. And of course, talk therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy can be helpful. What you can do today, of course, education, train your assessment team on the correct diagnosis uh, or diagnostic criteria for schizophrenia. Train staff at all levels of the signs, symptoms, and supportive responses when working with residents with schizophrenia diagnosis. Ensure residents with a diagnosis of schizophrenia get the appropriate level of counseling and side check care in your facilities. Um, and of course, bring the power of that interdisciplinary team uh, to that resident to make sure that everybody knows what's going on to help them with their treatment and make sure symptoms communicated with staff at all levels. Assess the stimuli in the nursing facility, right? Residents with a diagnosis of schizophrenia do better with a predictable routine in a calm, stable environment, which I frankly probably fits for most of the residents. Um, and we want to encourage people to get have mental stimulation, social interaction, emotional well-being. So help them to come to art therapy, music therapy, um, group activities. Um, and how do we tailor the activities to resident skills, needs, abilities, and preferences in a person-centered care? And of course, we wanna make these all part of the person's care plan. 